In the world of film, we've been conditioned to temper expectations greatly for releases in the month of January. The overwhelming majority of films with awards, aspirations, generally the films we all look forward to, are saved until the last few months of the year, where they all remain fresh in the minds of the shadowy cabals that pick Oscar winners. January is the time where we might expect the box office bombs and the latest regurgitated horror reboot or sequel to drop. But this year Netflix is disrupting that trend with a fascinating and starkly original stop motion animated anthology film called The House. The House is unlike anything I've ever seen before. It is delightfully weird. The design of the characters and the sets they inhabit are meticulously crafted and contribute greatly to the overarching sense of uneasiness and creepiness. This is especially true of the anthology's first two stories. The third and final story drifts away from the first two in terms of atmosphere, and I guess also in terms of location. While the first two acts in the history of the titular house burrow deep under your skin and catalyze an inner sense of uncanniness, the final chapter is more grounded and sends us off on a hopeful and optimistic note. And on that note, I should issue the spoiler disclaimer at this time. If you haven't yet seen Netflix's The House, go and watch it, form your own opinion on it, and then come back to this video afterwards. I think it is a work that is greatly worth your time. Now, the title of this video will seem a bit clickbaity to a lot of people. It'll seem like I'm connecting this strange stop-motion flick to David Lynch simply out of the film's virtue of weirdness. But from my viewing of the house, I'm inclined to describe it with an adjective normally reserved for the great surrealist works, and that adjective is Lynchian. A clear interpretation of the adjective spawned by Lynch's work does not come easily. If you want to hear an in-depth attempt to capture and wrangle a definition out of that amorphous word, click on the card on the top right hand corner to watch an old video of mine dedicated purely to Lynch's work. But for the sake of this video, I'll try to boil the definition of Lynchian down to its essence, which I would describe as being a strange, dreamlike sensibility in which, through surreal imagery and an emphasis on individual interpretation, a dreamlike state is simulated. In a similar way to uncovering the meaning of a weird dream, lingering in such a state can lead us to truths that may have stayed submerged otherwise. There are other common threads and themes that are essential to Lynchian works, such as fear and anxiety stemming from the unknown and from a lack of predictability, and dark malignant underbellies buried under benevolent facades. Both of these Lynchian elements fuel the house's fires, but the one specific Lynchian theme I want to highlight is the insistence on a work's subjective interpretation. The view that a film's ultimate meaning is the one we project onto it when it stimulates our unconscious. We know from his famous refusal to explain in really any detail at all the meanings of his films that David Lynch greatly values and respects the views and perceptions of the individual filmgoer. His systematic, ironclad silence validates any and all interpretations. None can be wrong, because on the individual level it is that person's life experience and subconscious brew which makes it true. With the weird richness of all three of these stop-motion tales, there is doubtlessly a myriad of different interpretations out there. In the spirit of the film's Lynchian DNA, however, I'm going to share some of what I personally extracted from each of these three stories, and I want to encourage you guys to compare and contrast your own interpretations of the house in the comments section. And again, if you're still watching this video and haven't seen the movie yet, go see the movie first and then come back. The house's first story takes us back in time to what I would assume is the 19th century. We're thrown into an ordinary household where an ordinary family lives an ordinary life. Then something extraordinary happens. They're visited by somewhat estranged and distant family members 
who scold our protagonists for their humble means, igniting a desire within the father Raymond to not only immunize his family from the ridicule of bitter relatives, but to elevate their family status. That desire lures him into a Faustian bargain, and out of that, the house and a cycle of pain, frustration, and anguish are created. Many Lynchian elements are at work here. From the moment Raymond enters Mr. Van Schoenbeek's midnight carriage, an uneasy atmosphere ensues. This atmosphere is only amplified by the creepy antics of Mr. Thomas and the construction crew around the house. Something is wrong, and we don't know what, but we're along for the ride and we want to find out. The primary theme at play in this tale is materialism, and its scourge afflicts both Raymond and his wife Penny upon taking up their residence in the house. Particularly, they're the most enamored with the fireplace and the sewing machine, respectively, and the upgrades they represent in their class ascension. They're both fully initiated into the trance of materialism when they're hypnotized by the lights in the dining room. As the story goes along and the spell the house binds them to only grows stronger, a stark contrast is grown between Raymond and Penny and their daughter, Mabel. Mabel grows increasingly reluctant to their new fine living and is repelled by the charms of Van Schoenbeek's house. She reacts with horror to the sight of their old cottage being scrapped for parts, while her father laughs with delight, secure from the vantage of their new ivory tower. Mabel was more than satisfied with the old life their family enjoyed, as long as they were together, that is. Her parents, on the other hand, lacked her naive satisfaction and pawned their humble yet happy life for a material upgrade. And as the old adage goes, the things they owned ended up owning them. Or, more accurately, they became the things they owned, swallowed up by the house that offered them the wealth they desired. In the beginning of the story, one source of Raymond's motivation is a backhanded comment from one of the family's cold relatives. She reminds him of his father's weakness for gambling and informs Raymond that he retains much of that weakness. In the end, Raymond's gamble with Van Schoenbeek costs him everything, and that prophecy ironically fulfills itself via paradoxical intention. Raymond and Penny allowed the criticism of their distant relatives to overpower them. En route to a happy, satisfying life, the crabs manage to drag them back down to the bottom of the bucket. Continuing on that ironic tone, it is the act of burning Mabel's dollhouse, a symbol of their old life, that ignites the fires of their demise. The lessons and interpretations I've drawn out of the house's first story are common ones most people will get out of it. All that glitters isn't gold. An obsession with materialism will end with your things owning you. Treasure and value the people in your life over those vampiric material objects. And finally, don't take criticism from your nasty relatives to heart. These are all important messages that people need to digest, and all of that, I think, comes across pretty clearly. But what doesn't come across clearly, and what interests me the most about this story, and really the whole movie in general, is Van Schoenbeek's ulterior motivation. We can easily tell that he gained some perverse pleasure from the corruption of a wholesome family. The question that remains is why? Why did he enjoy disrupting Mabel's idyllic childhood? And why did he enjoy observing Raymond and Penny's metamorphosis into his house? The quest for answers to these questions takes us to the second story, and into what appears to be the modern day, to a different kind of metamorphosis. The story of the developer is a relatively simple one. His financial future is tied up in the modern iteration of Van Schoenbeek's house, and in order to live with some semblance of peace, he must sell it. And he is very determined. With persistence and great effort, he installs sparkling new appliances into the house and commits every one of their details to memory so he can regurgitate them to every potential buyer that comes his way. He is a fancy suit, 
offering a plate of fancy canapes, distracting the viewers from the darkness within. In this sense, materialism does again play a role in this story, but with the developer, the obsession with material items is a means to an end, whereas in the first story, the material items were an end in itself. For the developer, the appliances and canapes are a smokescreen. They're merely an appearance to disguise his unraveling mental state. Further evidence for this is seen through the symbolism of the insect infestation ravaging the inside of the house. This could also be a metaphor for the dark forces connected with the house's history, similar to the way insects symbolize the hidden dark underbelly in David Lynch's Blue Velvet. The way the developer reacts to the discovery of the bugs is very telling. Instead of taking a course of action that would solve the problem but be time-consuming, he takes the shortcut, patching up larger issues with disastrous potential with a bit of glue and bug poison. In my view, the second story piggybacks on the theme of materialism to tell a cautionary tale about the toll and dangers that overworking and toxic productivity can have on mental health. The developer is so consumed by his goal of selling the house that he neglects his mental health. We don't know much about the developer's past, but we can assume he doesn't have any real close family or friends from the fact that he harassingly calls and spills his guts out to his dentist of all people. The neglect for his mental health amplifies into harassment and later delusion as the film meanders into its more surreal sequences, the choreographed insect dance. This chapter of the film reminded me very much of Franz Kafka's classic novella The Metamorphosis, in which the main character, an overworked salesman who is often subjected to demeaning treatment from superiors, wakes up one morning to discover he has been transformed into a giant, verminous insect. Gregor, Kafka's protagonist, is similar to the developer in that they are both subjected to demeaning and humiliating circumstances and are both overworked to the point of losing the essence of their being. They're both shaped into vermin by the nature of their circumstances and their failure to attend to the urgent harbingers of ailing mental health. I won't spoil the plot of Kafka's novella, but I will say that it's not exactly a happy ending. I wouldn't exactly say the same for the developer. While he ultimately failed to sell the house, and he succumbed to his baser instincts, he, in a twisted way, ended up gaining the same thing that Mabel lost. A family. The third and final episode of this anthology brings us to a post-apocalyptic world of sorts, in which a flood has swallowed up all but the Van Schoenbeek house. Our protagonist is Rosa, the house's new owner. Despite the devastation around them, she remains hopeful for a future in which the house lives up to its majestic potential. Like the developer, she is laser-focused on her goals, and that leads her into conflict with her two tenants, who, to Rosa's frustration, paid their rent with food and chakra crystals rather than money. Rosa's determination ultimately alienates her from Elias and Jen, her tenants, two people that genuinely cared about her, the only people who care about her. In this way, she is similar to Raymond and Penny. She's fallen for the house's mesmerizing charm to the detriment of her relationships. Eventually, under the house's trance, she drives away Elias, Jen, and Cosmos, who read the writing on the wall that the house will soon be submerged. Rosa is blind to the dangers of staying in the house. Rosa is afraid of the unknown, and what leaving the house with no solid plan could entail. But she represses her fears and refuses to acknowledge her impending doom. With the waters rising, Rosa remains steadfast on her mission to restore the house. That mission is sidetracked, however, by another one of the film's more surreal sequences. Rosa hallucinating in the mist. In my view, the mist symbolizes a kind of mental fog enveloping Rosa and preventing her from seeing the ultimate futility of her mission. She wants to restore the house because she wants a place to make memories in, but the reality of her circumstances 
make that a difficult task, unless, of course, lonely memories are her preference. The mist represents the unknown. Beyond the leaky confines of the house, there are no certainties. Rosa is appalled that her tenants are leaving her to take such a risky chance, such a shot in the dark. Just as our deepest fears are like dragons that guard our greatest treasures, Rosa had to embrace the mist to discover the truth, that the only certainty contained within the house was a certain and solitary death. The ending of the house metamorphosizing into a boat and Rosa sailing away with her friends is, I think, an optimistic conclusion to the house's journey. But it leaves several questions unanswered. One such question I was left with was that of the symbolic significance of the basement. In the first story, the basement was the storage space for the family's old and shabby possessions. In the second story, it was essentially the developer's home, and in the third and final story, it was a source of the house's flooding. In my interpretation, the basement represents a subconscious level of mind that reveals telling information about each of the characters. The basement serving as a storage place for forgotten mementos in the first story emphasizes the grip materialism had on Raymond and Penny. For the second story, the basement as the setting for the developer's bedroom revealed the true state of squalor he lived in and tried to cover up with his suit and canapes. The damp conditions and exposed cinder block highlighting the bare and stripped down conditions of his mental health. And in the third and final story, the flooding in the basement represented the anvil dangling over Rose's head with its splitting twine. It spelled out that for her, the only certainty she had in the house was the certainty of dying alone. There are many tidbits and easter eggs similar to this scattered all throughout the house, but the final question that hangs over my head most prominently is one regarding the motivation of the house's architect, Van Schoenbeek. While his influence was felt in the remaining two stories, we didn't get any clarity on his character, and for such a Lynchian film, I can't be surprised. If I had to take a crack, however, at interpreting Van Schoenbeek, I'd start by pointing out his supernatural aura. An artist seeking creative fulfillment, he might be, but purely human, he isn't. With the first story's family, that creative fulfillment was much sinister in nature than we could have imagined. One possible lens to view this motivation through is class. Assuming Van Schoenbeek and his creation represented wealth, his social experiment with Raymond and Penny could have been out of malice for a class of people he inherently looked down upon. Or, knowing the curse of materialism intimately, Van Schoenbeek could have been using his powers to teach the lesson in the most sadistic way possible. There will be many different interpretations of Van Schoenbeek's nature, and we will likely never really know the truth, which, in the tradition of Lynchian works, preserves the film's inherent mystery and strengthens its appeal for individual interpretation. Despite Van Schoenbeek's nefarious influence, all three stories present hopeful messages on the importance of having and maintaining healthy relationships amidst all the struggles and obstacles, at least in my individual interpretation.